Steve, you've uh, talked about the relationship between philosophy and physics. Uh, what do you think of philosophy? Uh, well, I used to be very enthusiastic about uh, studying philosophy. I was a, had a minor in philosophy as an undergraduate, but uh, you know, f science, f particularly physics, for me, is so much more uh, predictive and capable of having real success and real failure. Uh, in physics, uh, you can often have the healthy experience of being found to be simply wrong about something. And I don't know how often philosophers <laughs> have that healthy experience. How often has a philosopher p published an article in which he said, I've decided I've been wrong about the nature of truth, <laughs> or something like that. Uh, so there's a crispness to physics which I find lacking in philosophy. On the other hand, philosophers, I think, understand this, and they, they would argue that that's not their job to calculate things or to predict things or to answer questions. Their job is to ask deep questions, and I have to agree with that. Uh, and, uh, but the questions they ask don't really seem to me to be helpful in physics. For instance, there's a tremendous... Uh, philosophical concern about the nature of truth, the nature of reality. Uh, people in everyday life use concepts like truth and reality in a, in a, in the, in, in a useful way. I mean, they, they deal with those concepts. They say, well, it's true the newspaper wasn't delivered today, and the cause of it was the newspaper deliverer was overslept, and uh, I, I really hope it'll be delivered tomorrow. Um, the use of truth and reality and cause and so on in science seems to me not different in any philosophically relevant way from their use in everyday life. And since we're comfortable with these concepts in everyday life, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be comfortable with them in science. And I don't mean that the, I want to emphasize, I don't mean that the scientist has a deep understanding of truth and reality which uh, makes philosophy unnecessary. I don't feel that, that I understand what is meant by truth in any profound way. I, I'm a principled philistine. I, I, <laughs> I understand truth in science the same way I understand it in everyday life, and I don't see that any more is needed. So that although philosophers may have a way of asking profound questions about truth or reality or cause, uh, they just isn't helpful to the work of a scientist. And historically, I think it never has been helpful, uh, with the one exception that um, every once in a while, uh, scientists have been bedeviled by a philosophical doctrine of one kind or another. Uh, for example, uh, when Newton's theories were became known on the continent, it was felt that they were insufficiently mechanistic because they were involved action at a distance. The sun attracts the earth over 93 million miles, and that was repellent to the scientists, particularly in France, who had become imbued with ideas due to Descartes that things had to happen because of local pushings and pullings, a mechanical philosophy. Well, science there played the, well, science played the role, but also with the help of uh, British philosophy of dispelling what I regard as the uh, counterproductive doctrines of continental philosophy. So philosophy had its benefit by negating the negative yeah. effects of other philosophies. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, I once used the analogy that uh, just as uh, nation states generally didn't have any particular value to their inhabitants, uh, until the invention of the post office, uh, except protecting their inhabitants from other nation states. And philosophy <laughs> seemed to me somewhat like that. Um, this, but this has taken a long time to understand. Uh, of course, the word scientist only dates back to the early 19th century. Before uh, it was coined by William Hewell in the early 19th century, there was no word scientist. People spoke of philosophers or natural philosophers to distinguish them from other kinds of philosophers. And, um, you know, the great work of Newton is called uh, The Principles of Mathematical Philosophy. Uh, 
it took a while to understand that science is different from philosophy, that perhaps I should say philosophy is different from science, that they are, they both can proceed and perhaps both have legitimate functions, but they're not the same. Um, now, it, it may be that, that there's some deep philosophical truth which in the future will turn out to be the key to uh, advance in physics, but I haven't seen it <laughs> in my time, and I'm skeptical. Do you see boundaries for science, and to you, what would they be? Well, science uh, deals with what is, with questions of fact. It has nothing to say about uh, questions of value or morality. Uh, there's a, it seems to me, unbridgeable gulf between the is and the ought. Yeah. Now, we scientists can explain why people have moral codes. I mean, they can talk about uh, the fact that we have small numbers of offspring, so we take care of them, and that develops a sense of caring. The hormones flood our bodies when mm -hmm. our, we have children, and we make us loving. Or that we hunt in tribes, and that's so that we tend to be loyal to the people around us. Uh, but none of that explains why those are things we ought to do. And in fact, in some cases, what we ought to do, it seems to me, is to go against our biological mm -hmm. background. For example, biologically, men and women are very different. But I think one of the great things that's happened in the last century is that we've learned that all opportunities that are open to men ought to be open to women also, that we ought to transcend that biological difference where we, where we can. Um, there, I, uh, the fact that science has nothing to say about what ought to be, but only about what it is, uh, has left many people dissatisfied with science, people feeling that science isn't enough to build a life on. And I agree with that. It's not. It's just a part of it. It's a very nice part of my <laughs> life, but it's only a part of it. There are lots of other things. And for some people, uh, have turned to, to religion as filling up the rest of what they need. I don't find that satisfactory. I, I, it seems to me, in the first place, that historically uh, religion has not done a very good job of telling us what we ought to do. Uh, you can see that in the world today when religious uh, zealots uh, are causing much of the trouble, especially in Islam, are causing much of the trouble in the world. Um, but on a deeper level, the message of uh, especially the great a Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, seems to me fundamentally immoral in that it instead of taking as the highest ideal that we should be good and kind and loving to each other, it replaces it with an ideal of obedience and worship of, of a God who surely doesn't need our, <laughs> our support. Um, so that the ideal is Abraham, who at God's command is willing to sacrifice either, either Isaac, if you're a Jew or a Christian, or Ishmael, if you're yeah. a Muslim. Uh, that seems to me utterly repugnant. Uh, people seem to me to be searching for a big truth to fill their lives. Uh, science can't provide it because science has nothing to say about morals or values. And so they turn to religion or they turn away from religion to some other big truth like Marxism or Maoism or, or uh, or laissez-faire capitalism. Uh, and I think the human race has to grow up and give up the search for a big truth in human affairs.